array of topics. Um, as I was saying, we have four talks this afternoon, uh, ranging a wider a range of top, a wide array of topics, from paleontology to botany to astronomy. And um, without further introductions, let me um, introduce Dr. Carmen Nacarino Menezes from the Institute Catala de Paleontologia Miquel Cruzafont in Barcelona, who's going to talk about um, paleontology. The title of her talk is How did extinct horses from South Africa grow up? The microscopic structure of their fossil bones and teeth got the clue. So, Carmen, if um, you're so kind to take the floor, you're welcome. Okay, thank you, Saul. Um, okay, uh, I'm sharing the screen. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. Okay, and you can see it uh, in the whole screen, right? Yes. Okay. Well, so thank you so much, uh, Saul, for your presentation. I hope that you are, all of you, all the attendees, are enjoying this first South Africa Spain Research Forum. Um, today, I'm going to talk about my research as a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Cape Town where I applied a specific technique known as paleohistology uh, to different fossil remains to try to reconstruct the biology, ecology, and evolution of different extinct animals. Um, bone and dental paleohistology, which uh, is a technique that I used, consists on the microscopic study of these uh, biological tissues. And I use that I use that technique um, because it is well known that it provides um, in, uh, important insights into the biology of extinct animals. Specifically, uh, bone histology provides information about growth rate and age of maturity, while dental histology uh, provides information about growth rate, age of age of winning, and age of maturity. Uh, inferences about growth rates be, uh, based on bone histology rely mainly on the so-called Dampuyna rule. According to this rule, the different bone tissue types differ in the rate of deposition, with um, one tissue type called lamellar bone presenting the lowest rate of deposition, while other tissues, uh, such as those uh, known as fibrolamellar bones, um, uh, present the highest rates of the position. Um, other kind of tissues, such as the parallel fiber bone, present intermediate level of formation. And due to this close relationship between bone tissue types and their respective rate of, of formation, um, different authors have used the uh, identification of different tissue types to identify differences in the rate of growth among the species. But interestingly, bone tissue types do not only vary uh, between a species, but also during ontogeny. In mammals, for example, it is common to find a fast growing tissue, a fibrolamellar bone, during the first stages of ontogeny. And a slow growing lamellar bone, this is slow growing tissue um, in the outer part of the bone, uh, because it appears when the animal approaches its adult body size. And actually, the transition from this fast growing tissue to the slow growing one is considered to mark the attainment of uh, sexual and skeletal maturity. And indeed, several authors have proposed that estimations of the age at maturity can be obtained by counting the cyclical growth marks present within the bone cortex before the appearance of this outer circumferential layer. Um, these cyclical growth marks are usually thin dark lines or narrow bands of lamellar tissue that are deposited annually in response to metabolic and hormonal cycles. But dental enamel, among other dental tissues, also registered cyclical uh, growth marks. One of these uh, cyclical growth marks and the, are the so-called enamel laminations, which are uh, formed every 24 hours. 
And because we know that they present this specific periodicity, we can count them and measure them to estimate different parameters that register rates of tooth formation. For example, the daily secretion rate or the anomalous tension rate. The daily secretion rate represents the rate at which, at which the enamel grows in life, while the enamel extension rate represents the rate at which the enamel grows in height. So, uh, moreover, this, uh, the latter parameter, the enamel extension rate, uh, has been considered a proxy of the whole organism's growth rate. And because we know that these lines present a daily periodicity, we can also count them um, within a whole crown to estimate uh, the time of crown formation. And the interesting thing of doing that is because the timing of the end of crown formation correlates with the time of eruption of the tooth. And the time of eruption of several teeth, such as, for example, the first and third lower molar, correlates in turn with key life history traits, such as the age at winning and the age at the skeletal maturity, respectively. So the thing is that if we estimate the ground formation time of these uh, two teeth, the first and third lower molar, we can get information about this important life history trait. So here, uh, I'm going to show you the results that we obtained uh, of applying bone and dental paleontology uh, to the fossil remains of an extinct three-toed horse, which was called Eurigna doipus boyeri, that lived in the Pliocene of South Africa. Uh, specifically, the remains that we have studied came from a paleontological site that is uh, known today as the West Coast Fossil Park. Uh, the name of the fossil site is uh, Langebambek, but nowadays all the area is the West Coast Fossil Park. And um, this area is located in the, uh, in the southernmost part of Africa, in South Africa, uh, approximately 120 kilometers north of the city of Cape Town. So if you are a rounder, I recommend you to go and visit the site. Um, so today, um, several studies had uh, analyzed the uh, bones and teeth of this extinct horse, but there is still much that we do not know about its biology, and this is why we perform this study on the uh, paleontology. What we did specifically was to uh, section different bones, uh, four metapodia, two femora, and three first lower molars and uh, two third lower molars, um, using standard techniques that involve uh, different ste steps of embedding, cutting, and grinding. And we later observed these uh, histological slides under a microscope to identify the uh, growth marks or the tissue types. Um, the, these results have been recently published in the Theological Journal of the Linnean Society, uh, which is well positioned within the uh, theology section of these uh, kind of journals. And uh, I recommend you to read it if you want to dig in the results, but Today, I will present you the most important ones. So um, when we analyzed the bone histology of this extinct horse, we found that all the bones that we studied were composed of a fast-growing, uh, highly vascularized fibrolamellar bone. An interesting thing was that when we compared the world results with those obtained in other extinct and extant horses, we observed that the horse from Langevambeck present a bone tissue much more vascularized. Um, this suggests that it presented a higher rate of growth. As I briefly said before, we also analyzed the cyclical growth marks uh, in these bones, and we could count uh, we, we, uh, we could count up to three cyclical growth marks before the outer circumferential layer in the metacarpia and metatarsi, and five cyclical growth marks before the outer circumferential layer in the femur. Again, when we compare our results with uh, previously uh, published research, we found that the uh, horse from Langevambeck present a higher number of growth marks before the appearance of this slow-growing um, bone in the external cortex. 
And uh, this means that the uh, outer circumferential layer appears later. And uh, because, as I said before, this tissue is correlated with the age at skeletal and reproductive maturity. Um, we can say that the horse from Blanque Van Bet present a delay in these life history traits as compared to other extant and extinct horses. Um, specifically, the timing of the position of the outer circumferential layer in the femora has been correlated with the age at, at reproductive maturity. So, because we found five cyclical growth marks, we estimated an age at reproductive maturity of five years for this horse. Uh, we also analyze uh, different teeth that uh, I showed you before. And uh, first, we calculated the daily secretion rate of the enamel, for which we obtain values of around 15 microns per day. An interesting thing is that uh, these values are similar to those reported in other extinct horses, but not uh, to those reported in extant uh, zebras or hemions or asses. So this suggests that the dental enamel of the three-toed horse from Lango Van Beek is similar to that of other extinct three-toed horses rather than to extant epus. And uh, regarding the enamel extension rate, the values that we obtain vary between 200 and 1500 uh, microns per day. Again, these results are very similar to those obtained in other three-toed horses, but differ from those um, previously reported in EPUS. So again, the results from enamel extension rate suggest that the teeth of this horse grew at similar rates as compared to other three-toed horses and not to um, EPUS. But the, uh, one of the most striking features of this extinct horse from South Africa is that it presents very tall teeth. So the important question that we wanted to ask was, Okay, if rates of dental growth were the same in these horses in other little horses, how uh, how did animal got this very tall teeth? Well, uh, when we estimated crown formation times, we observed that the first and third lower molar took around 600 to 800 days to be formed respectively, which is actually much longer um, as compared to other three tooth horses in which the first and third lower molar only takes around uh, 550 or 700 days to be formed respectively. So this suggests that the very tall crowns of this uh, horse from South Africa were formed due to uh, longer crown formation times. And by the estimation of this crown formation time of uh, the first and third lower molar, we also obtain information about the age at winning and the age at the skeletal maturity of these fossil species. Our results show that the first lower molar took around 400 days to be formed. So if we assume that its formation started around birth, as it does in other equids, we propose that it would have erupted at the 13th month of life. And um, this uh, indicates that the age at winning was also the 13th month of life, which is actually later as compared to other extant and extinct horses. In the case of the uh, three, uh, third uh, lower molar, we obtained that um, it took around 600 days to be formed, but the formation of this tooth starts at the 21st month of life. So we estimated an age at eruption of 3.5 years and therefore an age at the skeletal maturity of 3.5 years, which is again later as compared to other uh, extant and extinct horses. So just to sum up the main results, uh, from bone histology, we obtain a late age at reproductive maturity for the horse from Lango Van Beek, also a late age at the skeletal maturity and a late age at wing. Uh, all these results suggest that this animal actually presented a very slow life history strategy in which uh, he or it allocated uh, most of its energy to traits related to growth and reproduction. It probably presented other, um, other features such as a long lifespan or a slow development. And actually, uh, this thing about a slow development 
is um, interesting because from bone histology, we uh, infer high rates of growth, but from dental histology, we infer moderate rates of growth. So we are still, we don't, we are still don't know which of these uh, two different techniques reflect the main uh, growth rate of the species and more research is needed. But the thing is, uh, this is low life history strategy is uh, according to life history theory is triggered by lower rates of predation. But the uh, fossil site of Langevambeck registers a higher num a high number of carnivorans that likely pride on Eurythmatricus foyeri on this field of course. So uh, how could this animal got this very uh, delayed life history? Well, one hypothesis could be that the close uh, woodland environment of the area provided some, prote some protection and shelter, and therefore that this animal was not uh, pride that much. But previous dietary analysis suggests that this animal lived in the grasslands, so this is not likely uh, what happened. On the other hand, uh, maybe predation was focused you on have, um, one minute. Yeah, I'm finishing. Finish. Um, and we think that this is what was happening because this is what we observed in extended species. And that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Car Carmen, for this uh, amazing talk on past horses in South Africa. Um, are there any questions? Um, we have time for one question. Well, given that there are no questions at the moment, there might be more at the end of the session. Um, let me introduce our second speaker, Dr. Anthony Essen from Witt School of Education in the University of the Witwatersrand, who's going to speak about mathematics education in context of language diversity. Welcome, Anthony, and please take the floor. Thank you very much. I'm trying to share my screen here. There we go. We can see it. All right. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me to this very important forum. Um, so I'm hoping to share my, my experiences of my research and how that has dovetailed with my host when I was at um, the Erasmus Plus staff exchange program. So how did it all start? Let me try to minimize here. Okay, so it all started in um, a working conference in Brazil, where we produced a book that has become a seminal book on language diversity. And what the agreement was for that book was that we all come together and present, and then we decide on who we want to work with and where the synergies are, obviously. And so there was um, synergy, obviously, between my work and Nuria Plena's work and that of Nancy Chitera. So we then decided to put together, I put together an abstract, including, including their names. And the abstract was accepted for the book. And we then produced this chapter in the book that talks about the context and multilingual context and teacher education in Spain, South Africa, and Malawi. So we, we, we entitled it as challenges across three different countries. And so that was the beginning of our, of our, of our journey, of our collaborative journey. And so the, the, basically the, the chapter explores um, teacher education and the linguistic context in which they, they work, um, the teacher, teachers or pre-service teachers um, receive their, their education and how they are attending, um, how, how language issues are attended to when they receive their education um, to become teachers. So subsequent to that, um, I had the privilege of, or Nuria Plenas had the privilege of being invited to South Africa and um, 
And he, she presented in a plenary in one of the biggest mathematics education conference. That was after my visit to, to her, obviously, in the Erasmus Plus program. And I was, I, I had the honor of presenting her to the crowd, to the participants at the conference. On the left-hand side there is the conference, particip the conference participants. And that is Nuria there on this side. And then I also had the privilege of inviting her home. Um, things um, she hosted me, I decided, okay, you can't come and leave South Africa without visiting me. She came with the others who are also in the field of language and mathematics. And, and so, so that was a, a somehow a continuation of our collaborative um, work between South Africa and Spain. But then, Subsequent to that, we also had um, work done in a special issue of, of a journal, which, which I'll, I'll show you just now. But, but let me talk a, a bit about the two contexts. Um, and I'm sure what I'm going to say is not, is not new at all to any of us here in terms of the multilingual context in South Africa and the multilingual context in Spain. Um, but I, so I'll just look at some notable differences, basically, between the multilingual context in South Africa and the multilingual context in Spain. Um, please note that my when I say Spain, I am more looking at a restricted area of Barcelona because Nuria Plenas works at the Autonomous University of Barcelona, which is in, um, in Catalonia. So, so my, uh, my, my presentation is restricted to, to, to that geographical area only when I talk about the linguistic context, especially. So the, look, the Catalan is the official language and is a local language. It's an official language. When you compare that to South Africa, we have, we have um, 11 official languages of which English, which is not a local language is one. Um, and some people might add Africans to that. Um, but then the key difference here is that in, in Catalonia, the official language of teaching and learning is Catalan, while in South Africa, the official language for teaching and learning in the first three years of schooling up to grade three is the home language for mostly those in private school, in public schools. And the switch is done in grade four um, to English in, in uh, both private and public schools. Okay, so from, from grade four onwards, the, the language of teaching and learning is English. Okay, so um, I'll just skip to the last, uh, the last two, two bullets there to say even though there's been, um, even, even though Catalonia can be regarded as bilingual in a way, the reality is that with, with, um, with the movement of people and with the world becoming more globalized, there've been people from North Africa, Central Asia, Latin America, all coming, going to Barcelona and all bringing with them a multitude of languages which makes the which makes Barcelona a highly multilingual society, just like South Africa. Okay, so one of the things we 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 noticed in our in our work together uh, between South Africa and and um, Spain is that even though there is some kind of um, differences between the nature of multilingualism in these two countries. There, there are similar challenges in teacher education, which is the field I work with mostly, and the same field, the same applies to Nuria Plenas. Okay, so while the teachers are aware of the context of their practice, that they are teaching, they are going to be teaching multilingual students and all that, that awareness is not reflected in their practice. So, so we, we see that teachers are being trained. The te the, those training the teachers understand that 
their training first and foremost multilingual um, um, students, um, pre-service teachers, um, they, and they understand to a large extent the implications of that because they, they do understand that they are training teachers who the pre-service teachers who at the end of their qualifications who go and teach multilingual students or multilingual learners. But then despite this awareness, in terms of their practice, we notice that that awareness is not reflected in their practice. And so in, in, an, in a previous work, which is work that Nuria planners also used to, to, to cast a lens on what is happening in, 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 in teacher education in, 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 in Barcelona, we talked about the different multiple layers involved in teacher education. So, so in, in, in teacher education, we are not, we're not only training teachers to become teachers of mathematics. Okay, we're not just doing that. In addition to that, we are training teachers who should become teachers of learners who are multilingual. So we are training teachers, uh, we are enculturating teachers into becoming teachers of mathematics in multilingual classrooms. And we are also teaching them to become learners of the mathematics content. Okay, they need to understand the mathematics content to be able to, 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 to teach. But at the same time, they need to understand mathematical practices. And I'll give an example of this. Most of us, I'll say we all did math at one time, point in time or the other in, in, our, in our lives. So you just see the teacher come to class and give you examples and ask you to solve this. Do these examples for me. Okay, so that's, that's, that's good. But then the question is, what informed that choice of example? How did that teacher choose those examples, those questions that he or she is giving you to solve? Is it following any principle at all? Or it is, is it just random? Okay, so that is exemplifying, that is the, uh, your ability to choose questions with meaning is, is, is a practice in mathematics. And there are several other practices. Okay, the last one is that we are also enculturating teachers to become proficient language users for the purpose of teaching and learning in, in mathematics. In, and, and here now, what I mean by language users is it's basically the language of teaching and learning. You need to also be competent in the language of teaching and learning for you to be able to, to teach mathematics with meaning. So we, we looked at these four and we asked ourselves, what is, what is present? in both contexts and what is different in both contexts. And we all came up with the same conclusions. Okay. We see some things are present, like we see, we see the enculturation into becoming, for example, learners of the content of mathematics. We see to some extent becoming teachers of mathematics there. But what we, we failed to see was enculturation into the intricacies involved in teaching mathematics in a context of language diversity. And, and also to some extent, we, we did not see becoming learners of mathematical practices. So we, we, for example, see people who could switch between Spanish and Catalan, but they, do, they don't kind of, enculturate their pre-service teachers into understanding what makes for a good code switching practice and what makes for a bad code switching practice and when therefore to code switch and when not to code switch. The same thing applies to examples and right? the questions that are given to learners or students in the class. The, the pre-service teachers, um, the teacher educators, the lecturers just come and they give the questions. They don't help the students understand the principle behind their choice of examples. Okay, so uh, this is, this is the, the, the special issue of ZDM, Mathematics Education Journal. It's one of the top journals in mathematics education in, uh, globally. So we, had, we, we both had individual papers in this, in this um, special issue. So 
I had I had one that had to deal with um, understanding the choice of examples in teacher education. And Nuria planners had one on specific language, how specific languages can our specific language use as resources and um, with specific specific focus on algebraic concepts. So going back to the choice of um, examples, please, when I say examples, I mean the questions and the tasks that a teacher or, or a lecturer gives to or uses in class or gives to, to students to, to solve. That's, that's referred to as examples in mathematics. So what has become very enlightening is a particular theory that is called variation theory in, 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 that has gained traction over the years in mathematics. Okay, you, you can see some, some people think one way of choosing examples, choosing questions is to start from the, the simplest to the more difficult one. So while that might be one way, um, research is suggesting that a better way is to look at it in terms of variation. So the key thing to look for is what is the object of learning? What is the, what is the purpose of this particular lesson, for example? And that will be the, the object of learning. And the object of learning can be the intended, it can be the enacted or the lived. The intended is the one I've, I want to teach and the enacted is how I teach it. And the lived experience is how the learners or your teachers ex or your, your students experience the example. Are they seeing the things you want them to see through your choice of examples or are they seeing something different from what you want them to see? Okay, so, and then in terms of the object of learning, how do we bring out the object of learning uh, variation theory talks about the patterns of variation or, and then critical features. So we need to understand the critical two features. Minutes. I have how many minutes? Two minutes. Two minutes. So understanding the critical features is, is very important. What are the critical features of, of a particular topic in mathematics? And then beginning to choose examples that are similar, that are contrasting, that show generalization and fusion and all that, so that these examples are well understood by, by, this, by the, the students. Okay, I'm, I'm going to skip that and, and, and go to this. So teacher education is quite complex. And when you see, see this diagram, you first look, think of it in terms of variation theory, but beyond variation theory, there is how the, the questions or the, the, the examples are used. And that is why we have this here. And how they are used to determine to what extent the, um, the, 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 the teacher educator attends to the different facets or multiple, multiple dimensions of of um, teacher education, which is all those becomings that I talked about earlier. So am I using it and enculturating them into becoming simply learners of mathematical content or am I paying attention to the other things in mathematics? Okay, I wanted to start an example I here that's in out you for to, um, Go to your concluding remarks, please. Yes, that's, that is it here. That's the last slide. So, so what are the potentials for, for, for future and further co collaboration between um, South Africa and Spain as, as I see it? So I think variation theory has provided a good tool that can be used. Um, and, and, and so we can think of how variation theory can be used to enhance the pre-service teachers, teachers language for learning mathematics. And, and through that, we can come up with what makes for a good example set in multilingual contexts and what makes for a good use of the example sets and how each context can, can, can benefit one from the other through the diversity and but also the similarities in the, link, in, in the nature of multilingualism that is in both contexts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, uh, Anthony. Uh, we have no time for questions, uh, so let me please um, let me introduce our third speaker of the afternoon, Dr. Irene Esteban.
uh, from the Evolutionary Studies Institute of the University of David Battersrand and the University of Barcelona. Uh, Irene is going to speak about the study of plants in the past through silica phytolids, South African case studies of applicability and implications. Claus, um, Irene, um, please take the floor. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, I think now you can see it. Okay, so uh, thank you, uh, Ate, for inviting me to speak in, the, in this first South African Spain forum. Uh, today I'm presenting uh, the study of plants uh, in the past through silica phytolids. And I will give some case studies, uh, some South African case studies. Okay, let's see. There we go. So what phytolids are? Phytolids are silica micro remains that are formed in living plants. Phytolids are produced when certain higher living plants uptake soluble silica together with water, which is transported and deposited into the aerial parts of the plants, where it precipitates and solidifies within and between the cell walls uh, of the plants, adopting the shape of the cell. So when a plant dies, uh, most of its phytolids uh, get released directly into the soil, creating an in situ record of phytolids that are characteristic of the flora composition. So using phytolids, I study plants, because plants are probably one of the most important natural resources for human societies. And this is because plants are a source of food, but are also a source of water, for example, from um, uh, plants with storage organs, like geophytes. Uh, but uh, uh, fires made also of wood and other types of, of plants. Uh, is also are also an important source, uh, for example, for cooking, uh, but also for light and warmth. And different parts of, of plants can also be used to create tools, for example, for hunting, fishing, uh, but also to, to, to create uh, objects to store it or transport, uh, not only food, but also uh, wood uh, and, and goods. And similarly, plants can be used to build a shelter or, or protection or to accommodate living areas. So my research uh, mainly explores the interaction between human behaviors and mostly those behaviors that are related to plants uh, and past environmental conditions through the Quaternary, uh, mainly focusing uh, in South Africa. I'm, uh, for example, interested in, one, in what kind of plants people were using, for example, to make fires. Uh, for example, what kind of uh, fires people were making, for what purposes, and depending on the purposes, what kind of plants people were using. Um, but also, because many plants are environmental sensitive. The, uh, the identification of plant remains from fossil records uh, and specifically to arche of archaeological records, in my case, we can make inferences in past environmental conditions and, uh, and past climates. Uh, most of my research, as I said, focuses on South Africa which is a, a region of importance uh, from a floristic, uh, climatic, and archaeological uh, perspective. So floristically, uh, in South Africa, we have nine vegetation biomes. And if, for example, we choose one of them, the Fimbos biome, we can see that it is composed, as you can see in the bottom, in the bottom image, is composed of a great diversity uh, of vegetation types. 
with very diverse biotic characteristics, each of them. And importantly, uh, this high diversity, if it also occurred during the Quaternary period, could have meant that a great uh, variety of plant and biotic resources could have occurred within the daily foraging range of a typical hunter-gatherer, which is normally 10 to 15 kilometers. And South Africa, from a climatical perspective, is uh, characterized by having uh, two, by having a bimodal rainfall seasonality, where in on the western part of the country, uh, rainfall uh, concentrates mostly during the winter months. And in this region, we have uh, a much higher presence of grasses with a C3 photosynthetic pathway. Meanwhile, most of the rest of the country uh, has most of uh, the rains uh, happening during the summer months. And in this region, uh, grasses dominate, grasses of a C4 photosynthetic pathway dominate. And then we have sweats in between what is called the all year rainfall zone, where rainfall is distributed uh, all over the year. And here we have a mix of C3 and C4 grasses. And this is important for phytolites because through phytolites we can identify different grass subfamilies, Boasia, um, and, and, and phytolites that belong to C3 or C4 grasses. And finally, the archaeological record of South Africa spans over a million years and is specifically rich for the time period that is associated with the appearance of modern humans, of our species, and of complex human behaviors. And it is known as the Middle Stone Age. So uh, for this presentation, I'm going to present three case studies in which I applied phytolith analysis, uh, but also uh, infrared spectroscopy analysis to study fire activities and site occupation patterns, uh, to study beds, beds used uh, by uh, past hunter-gatherers to, to sleep or to conduct uh, daily activities. And also uh, the, the third and last case study is the one that I use phytolites to detect paleoenvironmental changes in botanically poor records. So the first case study uh, focuses on the archaeological site known as Pinnacle Point 56, um, that is uh, located in the southern coast of South Africa. And this site uh, spans over uh, hun almost 100,000 uh, years. And it has a very long record of human occupations. In this slide, we can see the deposits dating uh, of MIS-5 between 90 and 74. And, uh, and these deposits are, as we can see in the image, characterized by a high presence of dark lenses of sediments, characteristic of uh, combustion features, which are prehistoric campfires. So these deposits are characterized, were characterized by a high phytolic concentration. And among the type of uh, plants observed, grasses were the dominant one. For what it does to, uh, to the mineralogy, uh, the clay that is one of the most important, the, the most common minerals uh, occurring in archaeological sites, we observe that this clay uh, hasn't been burned to very high temperatures. And we identify not too much calcite. And calcite is um, it's the main mineral produced after the burning of wood. And then we also observe aragonite. Aragonite is a polymorph of calcium carbonate, of calcium, calcium carbonate that transforms into calcite when it's burned to uh, temperatures over 350. 400 degrees Celsius. And so 
all, all this together, it, it was uh, um, uh, evidencing that uh, these fires didn't reach very high temperatures. And so the, the, the way we interpreted these fires is that people constructed very like, small uh, or short life fires that were mainly built with grasses and perhaps with some, with some green uh, sticks, some green wood collected from the surrounding environments. And, and therefore, uh, these campfires reflect short occupations, uh, which were probably sporadic or, or seasonal. And in this slide, we have the deposits that are placed uh, on top of the previous one uh, and date to the marine isotope stage four, dating to around 70,000 years ago. Um, in these records, we found a very different uh, uh, phytolith and mineralogical component. Uh, phytolith concentration was very low and it was mainly composed of irregular morphologies, which are both things characteristic of wood. Wood produces very low phytoliths and it doesn't produce many uh, diagnostic morphologies. And for what it does to the mineralogical composition, calcite was the main mineral component of the sediments, and aragonite in this case was readily preserved. And as we said before, uh, when aragonite is burned to high temperatures, it transforms into calcite. So this record was interpreted as indicative of the extensive presence of fire events. Probably these fires reach very high temperatures and, and probably they were continuously fed and most probably with dry wood. And this is because experiments show that when, uh, when dry wood is burned, uh, calcite is produced in, in, produced in my, much higher amounts than when green wood is burned. And so this extensive, ex extensive presence of campfires uh, were probably purposely built to improve uh, stone tool technology, as we got evidences of, of uh, microlithic technology uh, at the site during this time period. And they are also, this kind of fires, this kind of way of making fire, is also an indication of a high density and a constant human occupation of the site 70,000 years ago. Uh, now I'm going to pass to the second case study. Uh, that is uh, the one of Border Cave, where plant and organic preservation is excellent. As we can see in this photograph, uh, where we, we are observing a 40,000 year old grass bedding. But at Border Cave, an older bedding was dated to, and was identified dating to 227,000 years ago. But this one was identified, preserved as a silicified layer. It, this, this means as uh, a layer composed mainly of silica remains, and these silica remains are mainly phytoliths. Uh, in this, so this, this silicified 227,000 year old bedding was mainly composed of grasses, um, which were mainly preserved in anatomical connection, and this means this, this is an indication of very good preservation and probably of the in situ conditions of the deposit. Uh, but this silicified layer had an ashy layer underneath, which we thought was composed of uh, wrecked ashes. And this behavior of placing ashes under bedding is observed along the border cave sequence. But in the 227,000 year old deposits, the ashy layer uh, was found to be composed mainly of apatite uh, in its chemical composition and not calcite, which is characteristic of the burning of wool. 
And the phytolic composition of this ashy layer uh, is also dominated by grasses. And appetite can derive from, for example, the dissolution of bone, uh, the presence of guano in caves, but also of the diagenesis of calcite, and is one of the minerals that is identified from uh, uh, burnt grasses. And therefore, our results indicated that this ashy layer represents a much older bedding composed of grasses that was burned before the new bedding layer, the two, our 227,000-year-old uh, bedding was placed on top. And we speculated that the placement of bedding on top of the ashes of a previously uh, burned bedding was deliberated to, repair, to repeal crawling insects and to maintain camps clean of pests. And we interpreted this to be a complex behavior suggesting an early potential for cognitive, behavioral, and social, and social complexity that is more widely evident in innovative material culture uh, dating to around 200,000 years. The last case study that I'm going to present today is the one of the Mbulus case. A middle Stone Age site located in the Limpopo province in the interior of South Africa. Uh, mm -hmm. And the excavations of Mbulus, of Mbulus Cave are led by Paloma have, Peña, um, that is also a member of this society. Three remaining minutes. Sorry. Uh, at Mbulus, botanical remains were seldom preserved, and were found, and faunal remains uh, are also not preserved due to the acidity of the sediments. So here, finally, it's offered an opportunity to infer some of the past human activities and pl um, plant gathering strategies, as well as past environmental conditions. But here, I only focus on the later. At Mbulus, we observe a dominance of seafood grasses along the deposits, which is typical for this region where summer rainfall conditions dominate. However, a change was observed in the grass composition during the last occupation event, where C4 grasses decreased in numbers and morphologies, which are generally associated uh, to C3 grasses, increased. Therefore, this was interpreted as being representative of a change in climate, perhaps related to a period of increased winter rainfall or decrease in temperatures which could have also favored this change in the grass composition uh, as it occurs in tropical and intertropical highlands with the decreasing temperature C3 grasses uh, uh, start dominating. And we suggested that the hardening of the climatic conditions prompted the abandonment of human occupations in this region 90,000 years ago. And with this, I finish my presentation and I thank the society and everyone uh, that is here today. Thank you. Thank you, Irene, for this amazing talk. Um, sorry for that short gap. Um, is there any questions for Irene? Well, given that there are no questions, I think everything was extremely clear. Um, thank you for your talk. We move on to the last talk of the afternoon, uh, where Dr. Encarni Romero Colmenero uh, from the South African Astronomical Observatory and SALT is going to speak about optical astronomy in the Karoo. Um, welcome, Encarni, and uh, please take the floor. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone for inviting me and for hanging around for the last presentation of the super interesting day. It's been really amazing. So thank you very much for organizing and for inviting me. I'm going to share my presentation, just a second. Um, I hope you're seeing this. Are you seeing it? Yes. Um, Fantastic. Proceed. Great. 
So uh, my name is Encarni Romero Colmenero. I am an astronomer at the South African Astronomical Observatory, and I'm also the head of the SALT Astronomy Operations, Southern African Large Telescope um, Astronomy Operations. I'm going to tell you today a little bit about the SAO and about astronomy in the Karoo. I'm not sure why it's going on its own. How do I go back? OK. Uh, the South African Astronomical Observatory is the South African um, National Facility for Optical and Infrared Astronomy. Um, it's part of the National Research Foundation, which is funded directly by the South African Department of Science and Innovation, so BSI. The headquarters are located in Cape Town, but the research telescopes are actually located about 400 kilometers away from Cape Town in the Karoo Desert um, near Sutherland. And a picture on the left is kind of like a fun, fun image of the headquarters in Cape Town with the main building sort of um, created as like the center of the world. It was just a fun image. Um, Sutherland is located, as I mentioned, about 400 kilometers um, away from Cape Town in the middle of um, essentially the Karoo Desert. Um, and um, it seems to have some auto display that I wasn't expecting, sorry. Um, and in the semi-arid semi Karoo region, um, why do we want to go to Sutherland? Um, well, basically the dark skies. Sutherland is essentially in the middle of the desert, in the middle of the Karoo. There is not a very high density of population. That means the skies are dark, as pristine as we can get them. And they're amongst the best in the world in terms of dark levels. Um, and I'm glad Irene, Irene presented earlier. Um, it's actually placed in that line that she had dividing in the presentation earlier, the climate in South Africa from the summer to the, rain, to the winter rainfall, um, which actually means that it makes that we don't have a strong seasonal weather impact like other um, observatories around the world. So we're essentially open all year round. And we take about, there's a slight seasonal variance. So we get about 45% loss to weather in winter and 35% in summer. But in, in general, um, it's, a, it's a pretty good site. Um, the South African Astronomical Observatory, as you can see here, um, has actually changed a lot since I've been in the country. I arrived in uh, May 1999, and there were very essentially just those facilities that you see here um, marked in red. Those were essentially all that there was in the Karoo, um, and they've been mushrooming ever since. New facilities. It's a good site, good infrastructure. Um, good observatory facilities, and there's many international facilities in collaboration with the SAO that have now placed their telescopes and other research facilities in Sutherland. Um, in fact, from um, COVID, since the start of COVID, we actually were forced to go fully, pretty much fully remote observing, which was very done very successfully by, by the observatory. Um, I'm showing you here the three uh, main telescopes uh, from, from Sutherland. On the far right is the, the orange one is the 1.9 meter telescope. When I talk about the size of the telescope, I'm talking about the size of the main mirror, the primary mirror, which is essentially your light collecting bucket. Um, in the center is a one meter diameter telescope, so one meter. And on the far left is our brand new one meter telescope, Sibonise. Um, and I wanted to share with you, even though they're not actually yet even seen by the rest of the observatory, some of the images, um, the Sibonis, and it's a new camera that's been installed on Lesedi, uh, which is the one new one meter telescope. Um, and it's the kind of images that we can take uh, with the dark skies in Sutherland. So this instrument is currently being commissioned. So this is not as good as they can get, but um, it just shows the depth and the, and you know, how beautiful the images can be, but not only that, they actually tell you something about what you're looking at. So the, the green colors that you're seeing there are actually oxygen, while the red filaments that you're seeing are um, hydrogen. So this is actually an um, area where a lot of star have been exploding and it's a lot of heat um, illuminating the, the area around it. Um, another very beautiful image from Sibonise on, on Lesedi is, uh, is this one here, the Tarantula Nebula. And again, you can see the different colors illuminating where all the mass, mass, majority of the emission, the elements, if they tell us about the temperature, tells us about density, even tells us about the distance to these things, um, just by looking 
not only in imaging, but sometimes in slightly more detailed um, in, in splitting the light a little bit more into, into colors. Um, it, they can tell us a lot about, about what we're looking at and the evolution of the systems. And a galaxy I couldn't resist seeing us. I'm actually most interested in extragalactic um, astronomy. Here's a, a galaxy where you can see the red, um, the red colors in there as showing you areas of star formation and the blue as the new stars being formed is a hot um, star formation galaxy. Uh, what I work on is also located in Sutherland, is the Sutherland African Large Telescope, or to all of us, SALT, and it's an international partnership from many um, international um, collaborations um, from the US, uh, from Poland, from the UK, and from South Africa. South Africa, in fact, is about 33% partnership in SALT. And the South African Astronomical Observatory is contracted by, um, by SALT to operate and to um, produce the science from this telescope. Um, an image of SALT inside, um, where you can see the humongous light bucket is actually 91 one meter uh, mirrors that are organized in an array, they're all um, spherical mirrors. And the interesting thing about salt is it does not tip to follow as the as the earth rotates. Ah, here we go. As the earth rotates, the um, most telescopes rotate to compensate and keep your star in or whatever it is that you're observing your galaxy in the line of sight. Salt cannot do that. It can rotate it around, but it cannot tip. So at the top of, um, of salt, we have what we call the tracker. And this thing is the, a mechanical wonder that can actually keep our stars um, in, or whatever it is that we're pointing at. The limitation, of course, of not being able to follow the objects is that we actually have to wait for them to come into view, which means it's fully um, queued, queue observing. Everybody puts their observations in the queue. And we, the salt astronomers and the salt operators, observe for everyone and the data is sent to them in the morning. Um, um, it's, as I mentioned, it's an 11 meter in total primary mirror made up of one, 91 one meter segments, which is pretty big. Um, and it has what I meant by passive and active alignment systems. It means that once we align it um, using the CCAS tower, the center alignment tower, that sort of thing that sticks out on the side, it, the active segments, there's some, some sensors on the edges of the mirrors that keep it aligned for about a week. So we don't have to keep all those segments, they just keep themselves aligned very nicely so that we can get very nice sharp images. Here's some examples. This is the large Magellani cloud seen with salt. Um, and again, the colors here are telling you about the, not only about the distance, but also the density composition and the age of the stars. The redder ones are older, and the blue stars that you see there are younger, hotter and younger stars. Um, and uh, another galaxy, irresistible for me, with a lot of star formation. And um, in this, sorry, um, in this um, slide, I wanted to show also that um, with salt, because of its large collecting area, because of its essentially, it's a humongous light bucket. Um, what we can also do is take super fast images, a bit like you do with the sports fields, where you just take in a little bit your sports um, features um, with races and, and you know, try to get your stop camera. In a similar way, we do this to the stars. And if they happen to be variable, this one that I'm showing here is how bright it was, plots here, how bright it was during an eclipse. And the interesting thing here is the thing was kind of happily on a constant level, and then suddenly within a second, um, it was down, but the, these little knees over here are actually resolving a spot the size of Australia on the surface of a star that is the size of the Earth um, a, long, a long distance away. So it's a way of, you know, using, using this um, salt, you can actually see and resolve things on, on telescopes that you can't um, even resolve with the best telescopes in the world, but you actually, through various techniques, you are able to resolve them. Um, we can also, using, um, using salt, we can also tell you which parts of a galaxy that I showed you earlier are moving towards us and moving away from us, as shown here on the right. Um, 
and um, it also gives you a lot of information about how fast it is rotating and what is the mass of the entire galaxy, um, whether it has a supermassive black hole in the center. So you can get a lot of information from, from the super power, collecting power. The most exciting um, happening at the observatory right now is the Intelligent Observatory, um, where the whole entire observatory, including SALT and many, even many of our partner facilities, are, are going to be working as a unit, as a fast response. There's a lot of surveys coming up in the next couple of years that are going to produce a lot of images and um, fast images, sequences of images that are going to show us things that essentially go bump um, and appear on one image and they're staying for a while and disappear. A bit like supernovae, you can see the explosion. And then depending on um, whether they appear or disappear fast, um, you can characterize what it is they are. Uh, um, so it's important that we respond fast to these alerts and also that we automate the process as much as we can. And so, these uh, telescopes, including the older facilities, and I'm talking telescopes that are you know, 50 years old, are now being upgraded. They already have, as I mentioned, remote access, um, local access, so the astronomers can go and teach the students or do their own observations. They can access remotely from their own homes or from Cape Town, a remote observing station that we have in Cape Town. And some of these images that I showed you earlier with Sibonise were actually done robotically. So with the script that we send to the telescope, it points, it takes these images in the sequence that we want and sends the data to whomever asked for it. Um, so all of that obviously requires a lot of software development that we're very busy with and some dedicated instrumentation like Sibonise and like a few other um, more um, instruments that are coming up on SALT and on the other telescopes to facilitate this. So we're all ready to take up the challenge um, and it's a super exciting project. Um, and since this was a climate, um, climate session, um, I thought I'd mention some of the threats that the observatory faces. And, and these are not just the observatory in Cape Town, but also, I mean, in, in Sutherland, but also in, it's a, these are essentially global threats in general. Um, you're inefficient and by your, I mean, everyone else's, not mine, obviously. Inefficient city lighting, it essentially lights up the sky. Why can't we observe from Cape Town? Because you just cannot even see the Magellanic clouds in Cape Town. It's impossible to see most of, this, of the stars in the sky. Um, light pollution is a problem. Um, and as a result of also the energy crisis and um, trying to find clean, clean sources of energy, of which we're obviously very much in favor of, the construction of the wind farms near Sutherland, which is an excellent site because of the, it's quite windy around that area. Um, it's, um, it's a, poses a problem temporary in some cases. So the construction lights are temporary. The dust uh, that they, they're rising up into the atmosphere is also temporary while the construction lasts. But the compulsory lights on top of each turbine is more of a problem for us. Um, if you think that salt um, the sensitivity of salt is such that if you were to put a candle at the distance of the moon, we can detect it with salt. How are we not going to see those pilot activate th those lights? Um, so those lights on top of each turbine are on their own a light source of light pollution that is going to affect the observatory and is threatening our dark, our dark skies. Um, again, those constellation satellites, they're fantastic for internet access, and we really do welcome the development, but at the same time, they are a pollution to our skies. And I'll show you later what, what they look like on our images, or they could potentially look like. They're not so much of an impact at the moment in the Southern Hemisphere, but they, they could be if we don't control what we're doing. Um, mining, obviously dust, fracking, dust and tremors that shake in the delicate equipment on the telescopes. And weather pattern changes, I'm not going to say that we are seeing them because it's Sutherland weather is actually notoriously unpredictable. Um, possibly there may be a hint of, of pattern changes, but, um, but we're, seeing, we're seeing something, but we're not claiming that we're seeing it. But obviously, as you can imagine, weather pattern changes are gonna pose a threat to the observatory. Um, I wanted to show you some examples of light pollution. This is an image taken of the observatory. 
Sorry, it's you from have the observatory. One minute. Um, Excellent. Thank you. I'm going quickly. Um, and this orange that you see on the horizon um, is Cape Town, 400 kilometers away, Worcester in Cape Town. Um, and these are seen all the time. Here are some satellites coming across a field um, right when they are launched. So they usually space out a little bit, but you can see the trails that they leave on our skies. So you can imagine the, the mess that they're going to make on our science. Um, dust. These are, this is actually um, an image of uh, fire, not so much dust, but the effect is the same where you see the darkening. Not only are you losing light, but you're also losing preferentially the blue light. So not only are we able to see less, but we're also losing the information that the blue light uh, bring us. And it's giving us in erroneous information about the state of the sky. So dust is a problem. Um, Sutherland is in an um, astronomy geographic advantage area. It's protected. And the SAO and the Astronomy Management Authority, AMA, with the Department of Science and Innovation are working to protect the dark skies. So it's not all doom and gloom. We are already liaising with uh, farm construction crews to minimize the lighting and the dust during their construction. Uh, discussing with the South African Civil Aviation Authority on implemented pilot activated lights so that they're not on all the time, only when planes come over on the wind turbines, because we really do want those wind, wind turbines. Um, and the prohibition of fracking and mining within the Sutherland Central Astronomy Advantage Area has already been implemented to protect the, the site. And thank you, that's all. Thank you very much, uh, Carmi. Uh, with um, your amazing talk and beautiful pictures of the southern skies, we finished our session where we've gone from like the deep earth and the deep past to the skies and probably like future perspectives on that. So may I thank all the speakers for joining and if there are any other questions um, for any of the speakers, they are welcome. Uh, yes, I have one question for Encarni. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> with respect to the um, to the prospect of the intelligent observatory, um, this alert, uh, what is this going to based on in neutrino observations or or other actually articles? anything that goes bump? So it could be neutrino trigger alerts. We have X-ray alerts uh, from X-ray satellites. We have gamma ray alerts. Um, and the survey is coming up also in the optical. There's going to be SKA arrays, um, sorry, alerts from the SKA. SKA. They are already mm -hmm. alerts from Meerkat. So whenever astronomers find something interesting, something they don't know what it is, they, they generally raise an alert and other telescopes um, point to it, including um, the gravitational wave alerts. So we're responding to just about anything that goes bump. Mm -hmm. So they tell you about a region in, in the sky and you point yes, that way. And we point, mm -hmm. exactly, exactly. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> a thing that goes bump is only a thing that goes bump until you know what it is. So you need to follow it up <laughs> with other telescopes, mainly optical because that's what we, we started with and we have our best knowledge about mm -hmm. where things are in the optical. Okay, perfect, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Is there any other question for any of our speakers? Well, with, with that, I think we, we are closing the session just on time um, for the concluding remarks. Um, yeah, thank, thank you very much, Saul, for attending yeah. the session. Oh, you're very welcome. It's always a pleasure. Um, so I'll give back the word to um, uh, Francisco, and I um, hope to see you all soon in another conference. Okay, cheers. Thank you. Um, so first of all, I want to thank all the speakers, chairs, and, and attendees, because I think we all have learned today from people that are outside our research area. And that's something very interesting, because we are not used to present our research in an environment where we have people that it's not of our own research area. And also it makes you look at the science that it's been done in a more global way, 
and and you realize that what you see science as a whole uh, it is improving the the society in many ways and it is a good way also to to claim both alvaro and and the ambassador of Spain in South Africa have said at the beginning is that uh, science should be taken into account when doing relations between two countries or, or when doing any uh, political decision because science is a very strong asset that it's going to help develop a, a society. So with that claim, I want to thank everyone again uh, and i think that's that's all for today and i hope that next year we can organize this again and and have such many interesting talks as we have today <laughs>